Jesus said, empty your mind. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Be water, my friend. Hello, dear lovers of physical and mental greatness, and welcome to the first mushroom episode of The Flow Great Show. Yes, this episode is about shrooms, but not the magical kind that makes you see weird stuff and hallucinate, but the medical kind. You will find out why mushrooms are a highly interesting ingredient to many new supplements and foods and how they can help you be less stressed and improve your mental and physical performance. My guest is an expert in the field today. He is from Finland as other guests on this podcast have been. His name is Jako Halmetoja, and he is one of the authors of the highly interesting project, The Biohacker's Handbook, sort of an encyclopedia on the art of biohacking. He's also written books on mushrooms. He's a speaker at conferences on self-optimization and just a fascinating individual who hacks himself every day. And I'm very lucky to have him on this show. Now, enjoy this episode on the power of mushrooms with Jakko Halmetoja. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great having you. And, uh, you know, uh, I am very excited to talk to you about, uh, you know, nutrition and mushrooms after having been introduced to you by our mutual friend Demu Arena, who's also been on the Flow Show already, and he speaks in the highest tones of you and uh, and we've already <laughs> chatted now and you know just to jump in already in, in in the field because we are we're both biohackers you're the author of the biohacking handbook one of the authors and uh you, you've been wheeling and dealing in the field for a while now what is your definition of biohacking what is it it's kind of fun funny to me because it's it's quite a new term in, in essence, and for years I've been, you know, going with the, a bit more naturalistic philosophy or angle to these similar things. And then when I, you know, met them, who's really into tech and uh, other other kind of um, uh, signals that are raising up from many different angles and bringing up the, the leverage that we can have these days from technological side of things, it's it's kind of a synthesis of those both worlds and my definition for biohacking would be kind of um, in a superficial way just anything that uh, is benefiting your biology to work more optimi optimally and uh, that can be around sleep around nutrition around meditation so it basically covers anything that you are doing with the mission of you know getting the best out of you I like that definition very much, and uh, it, it you know goes along with with my own one I would say, and the one that you know I heard from Dave Asprey as well. So I think uh, it's it's just this great tool in a way to have to tweak your own screws, uh -huh. and and you know I got into it through professional sports. Now, how did you get into the field? How did you become a biohacker? <laughs> Yeah, in a way, I, I have a pretty similar story, you know, both of my parents are, are PEs and I pretty much raised, uh, you know, around sports institutes and places like that. And I've been just doing all kinds of athletics since, you know, day one. And uh, of course, when you are in different communities, you know, I've been doing martial arts, I've been playing ice hockey and football, I've been into extreme sports. So I've been, you know, just getting to know a lot of different communities and um, what it is almost always there is those people who are really into all sides of those things how you can you know make better choices around nutrition and you know your mental side of things and gear and equipment that you are using so I think like a bit more than 10 years ago I ran into um, this idea of idea of, of paleo nutrition with some of my martial arts friends and mm -hmm. after that I just dig, 
deeper into nutrition and all the sides of it. And uh, that's been the journey for me mostly because I, I realized that how much you can not just affect your your performance in in athletics by nutrition but also your mind and your mood and emotions and all these kind of abstract sides of of you and that was just so fascinating that now it's been almost 10 years just you know 25 hours a day just trying to figure out that why was that the the mechanistic side of those things and uh that had led me into, you know, herbalism and superfoods and, you know, medicinal mushroom and all the weird stuff. But uh, that that's in essence that what happened. Okay, wow. Then you were really one of the very early ones, I would say, or at least one yeah. of the earliest adopters of the paleo uh, yeah. diet that I know. But like, so let's talk about nutrition. So you were talking about paleo and what has happened in these 10 years? Do you still... Uh, call your diet paleo or have you evolved ever since then well i think one of the things that i've carried around from the from the early days is the idea that we pretty much pretty much domesticated all of the animals and all of the plants that we are finding from the supermarkets so so that was a revelation from the from the early days that still is one core angle of of my own diet and the teachings that I bring forward and I just think that whether it was from the animal kingdom whether it was from the plant kingdom or insects or mushrooms all of these different ideas there is so much behind the terms that people are usually just you know throwing around that yeah just eat more salad and more greens but you know I had this question going through my head that what kind of greens because you know the the salads that you will find from the supermarket are so highly domesticated that they don't contain any of the phytonutrients and alkaloids and stuff like that that were present in the paleolithic mm -hmm. area so of course i don't want to you know polarize this too much but there is just so much lost in the translation so to say from from these worlds and um yeah, I would con consider that I'm somewhere between, you know, uh, herbalism. So I really like to use a lot of, you know, plants and extracts. And, you know, I grow my own food in the summers. I gather a lot of wild herbs, wild mushrooms, that kind of stuff. And just try to go to more genetically powerful varieties and of course that's the same idea when it comes to animal products you know grass-fed meats and less domesticated animals and all that but but that's just one core thing and um, even when it comes to you know i took here like spring water so ah. now for now for the past i think eight years the only water that i've been drinking is is collected from the natural springs and you know the the whole philosophy is just much broader so i think that people are just picking some cherries that are you know good for they, their lifestyle but if you really think about like paleo water you know everybody is still drinking you know highly processed water and it's still one of the biggest you know volume things that you're putting into your body and just doesn't make any sense to me that people are so into nutrition then then they don't do anything about water or things like that so there are many philosophical ideas in that sense that have have a race from the paleolithic idea to me it's uh, really interesting because we uh, one of my very good friends here in the field matthias brandt he just came up with his own water startup so he is pretty much engineering his own water which is optimized nice. you know with i don't even know but like all uh, everything is balanced in order to give you really exactly what you need and uh, i'm very excited about that I'm, I'm also happy to to mention him at this point here yes. and i'll put it in the show notes so when you come to Berlin, you'll get really good water. I can promise you that. that that's so great to hear <laughs> because you, you become pretty picky um, in the water side if you've been, you know, just drinking really 
low TDS water for years and then you get, you know, not that good quality water, you, you will feel that pretty immediately. Wonderful. So you would say that you uh, follow a sort of herbalistic diet then. It's interesting. I've never heard that before. Uh, yeah, I think that that's just, just to give a quick idea. What I mean by that is that at some point when I you know, started to harvest more wild foods and stuff like that, you go to a place where you are not that much into, let's say, macronutrients anymore, but you are kind of modulating your biology, biology more with, um, let's say, stronger compounds. So this kind of uh, fasting half day and just eating, you know, a big elixir a day, which contains a lot of, you know, strong spices and strong herbs and stuff like that and that at some at some periods i you know eat more like you know just food <laughs> but for the most part it's just the let's say the baseline has moved more towards stronger plants stronger bitter compounds bitter plants and and if you do that you are not needing to eat or, or need to eat that much of a just mass of food and and that's been an interesting uh, test for me i'm not sure if I'll, I'll end up doing that for you know a decade but uh, that's that's pretty much what i what i do these days i like that and before we dig a little more into the individual superfoods and, and mushrooms that that you recommend that you work with I want to have, because now I have a nutrition expert in the, in, the, in the show, and I want to have you take on two different diets that I often discuss over dinner with friends, which is the vegan diet, the raw vegan diet, and the ketogenic diet, mm -hmm. which I sort of follow in, with, the, with the Bulletproof diet. So I do sort of a protocol with intermittent fasting, where I have a coffee with butter and oil in the morning, and then I usually don't eat until later that day, 3, 4 p.m., what is your take mm -hmm. on, on these two diets? Well, in the early days, I also tried, you know, raw vegan diet for, I think I sticked into it for several years, pretty much like hardcore. Everything is at le least organic or wild drinking, you know, wild water and all that. And I think it's really good to, you know, purify your body. And, and I mean, what I mean by that is it, you're just getting this super in, anti-inflammatory uh, state in your body and you are not, you know, probably producing as, mu as much, you know, hormones and stuff like that. So you get more in, in touch with your emotions and stuff like that. So I see a great value in that if you are, you know, going into immersion into yourself and doing more meditation and stuff like that. I definitely think that there is a big leverage in that side of things but i don't see I, and you know i've been following the whole um movement around raw veganism now like 10 years and i've seen the people who were there 10 years ago and they are not doing that anymore so oh, i don't okay. see that uh, uh, and i don't see that there is too much people who stick into it for you know decades and of course, people are promoting that in the state where they've been doing that for, you know, six months or a year or whatever. So I see great value in there. And, and what I think that it has teach me a lot is the, you know, quality around different ingredients, because it's like super, you know, hardcore with the different, you know, ingredients, just basic raw materials, raw plants, and what are the differences between between them and uh, how they're grown and all that. So it teach you, teaches you a lot about quality. But of course, there is the other side that you need to process intelligently some of these plants. And, you know, it's not so dualistic in many ways. But but yeah, I don't think that's a kind of long term diet, but it's it's it has value for short term. And and I definitely think that it's beneficial for people who want to get more in touch with the kind of uh, inner states because it, it definitely I felt like it kind of uh, uh, dissolved some boundaries between my emotions and my mind it's kind of a you know you get hyper um, how would I put it 
just hyper aware of your your deep deeper layers in many ways so i see value in there also so this this is the raw vegan diet yes yes so, but of course I, i can't say that you can't get those same same things by paleo or or you know ketogenic diet because that's more what i've been doing for the last five years or so and and i definitely get those same same feelings still but i i just think that that's the reason why people kind of get hooked for raw vegan diet in the beginning because you get into those states pretty quickly if you just you know get off most of the chunk that you are eating it's it's kind of highway to those those states and uh, with more kind of ketogenic diet and stuff like that when it's more sustainable it's kind of longer route and a more kind of balanced way to you know go towards your your inner inner states yeah what i really like about the, the vegan diet that it exists i've never followed it uh, i have to say but i like that there is a high focus on on high quality and mm -hmm. it just adds diversity you know just uh, here there are a couple shops here in berlin mitte uh, that offer raw vegan Uh, foods and, and and drinks and smoothies and so on and I just like having them because it's an alternative you know what once yes. in a while I want to have a couple of days without meat or without fish yes and so I, I notice just changing things up uh, benefits uh -huh. my body yeah. helps my body how about the the ketogenic diet and would you recommend to anyone following a strict <clears throat> ketogenic diet so pretty much being in ketosis every day for an extended amount of time is that recommendable well of course there's people who've been doing that for several years and with a, with a great success but that's that's with all every kind of diet there there are exceptions but i i don't know too many people who've been doing that successfully for for a decade so that's once again uh, something that i think it's valuable for most of the people for some period of time but um, when I think about diet in a bigger picture, I, I think that the big part is that what is doable for you. So it's, it's of course a lifestyle thing that if you are, you know, thinking about your lifestyle for the next decade for a small percent of people, I think that's something that they will stick into for a long period of time, but it might be for several months, you know, a few years that people get a great results, but there's just uh, that aspect one that once again, that you need to kind of commit to that path. And uh, I, I haven't seen too many people still doing that for a really long time, but that's, that's pretty much with every diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you experimented with exogenous ketones already? Yes. How did that work? I think that it, that's really good for for people who are doing a lot of uh, brain work, you know, information workers and people who are doing desk general work. In in that sense, I, I definitely see the value in there, and it's just so cool to see these things and tools raising up because there will be people who will get a tremendous benefit from those things and keep doing them. But yeah, it's a very interesting subject. Very cool. Okay, let's switch to our next bigger topic, which is supplements and superfoods. And I've read that you actually, you've, I haven't read the book, but I've read that you've written a book about chaga mushroom. Yes. So this is now already, uh, I'd, say, I'd say, a subsection in supplements, it's mushrooms. And this is where I think uh, you're very knowledgeable about more than any other person that I know. <laughs> So what, where does the fascination with mushrooms come from? Where are the benefits here? Well, I think that at some point when I, you know, from the sports world where the focus is purely on supplement side, more, you know, synthetic things. And then at the naturalistic side, there's not that much um, talking about supplements, that, but more like whole food extracts and stuff like that. Um, what was in between was this whole kingdom of mushrooms and uh, in Finland we have a you know great variety of different you know wild mushrooms and this is the chaga oh um, this is the chaga cool yeah I actually yeah. have I have a powder here yes uh, that was recommended to me by Demu 
I'd yes. never seen the, the original one. That lo almost looks like a piece of wood. Yeah, that looks so. So it's a, a bit different compared to, let's say, a Rishi mushroom, which contains the spores. To all the, the iTunes protein. listeners, by the way. So Yako is showing me right now the mushrooms. So uh, yes. I, I'll put them in the show notes, some pictures, some photos. Yeah. So <laughs> this is a Rishi and it contains the spores here in the fruiting body. Uh -huh. But this part of chaga that we are using, it's a sterile, so it doesn't contain the spores. So it's a kind of a anomaly in the in the mushroom world. But, uh, you know, when I went to the research, because there's so much science done uh, around mushrooms, I was just fascinated that nobody was talking about them in Finland. And, you know, I, I've gone through all the, you know, old books about herbalism in Finnish and there's like a few mentions here and there about chaga and then you look at the research like they've been using that in Russia for you know hundreds of years and what I've actually done in the past few years I've um, hired a, a translation a translator who knows Russian uh, to translate these old books that were written in Russian Wow, and there's so there's so much you, you know, hired a translator to, to yes, yes, because you know when you run into You know references in the old books that there is whole books written on Chaga But they are only published, you know in the 50s in Russian But nobody knows what's in there because it's never translated into English I was just so like, whoa, I need to check them out. And the whole book is pretty much like, you know, observations and case studies about, you know, chaga therapy for different diseases, whether it was cancer, neuro neurological diseases and stuff like that. So that's just that even though I can't find those things on, on PubMed, there is still a lot of things that that's been documented around these things because these these been around for a long time. And especially with mushrooms, they've been used as a tinder, so for keeping fire for literally thousands of years. Mm. So the relationship with humans and mushrooms is in many cases much, much older than with most of the plants that we see kind of traditional herbal medicines. So... There's just so much to be said about mushrooms. and At this uh, point, think, Jakob, maybe yes. because I know a lot of people that are listening, they associate mushrooms with the so-called magic mushrooms, the shrooms. <laughs> but there's a big difference between those and I think the ones that you mostly focus on. Yes, yes. And actually what I'm mostly talking about in here are tree mushrooms. So most of the medicinal mushrooms are actually growing on trees. So polypores. So there is also a big difference from the safety aspects that I'm not talking about that much from the about the mushrooms that are growing on ground, because these things are pretty much kind of um, extracting the the active ingredients from the host tree, and I I could pretty much go to the forest and pick any tree mushroom and it would be safe for human com consumption. So there is, and of course, I'm not now saying just to simplify the idea, but but there is not um, similar chemistry on tree mushrooms that there is on mushrooms that are growing on ground. Mm. And that's a big, big um, angle also that most of the medicinal mushrooms are tree mushrooms. But yeah, that's that's now we're not talking about magic mushrooms, even though there is also raising awareness of, you know, applications from those things. But yeah, you know, Tim Ferriss just thing. invested, uh, I think, one hundred thousand dollars in research for psilocybin, psilocybin, uh, yeah, psilocybin uh, in the treatment of depression, I think. Yes, yes. So that's true. But let's let's focus again on the tree mushrooms, because I think there is uh, well, a lot of uh, there are a lot of benefits there that people are really not aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, I've actually was introduced to chaga by Demu, and I'm very mm -hmm. surprised I've never heard of it before because I've been you know in the field for several years now, yes. and uh, the same with cordyceps. Mm -hmm. So, where are the benefits here? What do, can these mushrooms do to you, and how should you take them in? Yes, so I think that the the main idea is that 
mushrooms produce very different chemistry that plants do. It's a much older kingdom that's been around, you know, this earth for much longer. And uh, if you have organism that's that's had a um, need to fight off, you know, different other fungi, different viruses, bacteria, it produces, you know, highly antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral compounds on its cell walls and outside of it. So that's why, you know, most of our, you know, antibiot antibiotics and antiviral medicines and those things are first found in fungal kingdom. So it's a huge array of medicines that were first discovered from, from this kingdom. Like penicillin, uh, for example. Uh, for example, tetracyclines and many other, you know, antibiotics that people are very familiar with. But, but also many cancer medicines, MS medicines, there is just huge variety of different compounds that are at this point also under, you know, clinical trials. And, and I'm just so fascinated about the whole um, possibilities around around the chemistry that these things produce. So that's the first thing to understand that plants are just like first grade chemists compared to mushrooms who are like professors at the university, you know, with the more intelligence. I love that plants and, are first grade chemists. <laughs> yes, yes. That's going to be the, and, your quote on, on the top of the show notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, and one of the other things is that whenever I've, you know, visited at the Amazon or or those areas and, you know, went to a walk with the local shaman, most of the things that they use in those ecosystems is, you know, tree barks, whether it was cinnamon, whether it was, you know, eucomia or other local local medicines. It took me a while to understand that trees are one of the most, you know, sophisticated medicinal plants in the world and they produce you know highly highly antiviral and beneficial compounds on on the surface of the tree and what these you know tree mushrooms do they kind of uh, you know extract those compounds to themselves and then mm. your your other question is that how we get can get the access to these because they are i'm not going to eat you know a rishi mushroom like this because it's it's made made of very hard um, chitin, you know, cells, mm -hmm. and we don't have you know chitinase production in our digestion, so we can break them down. So what we basically need to do is is not just to pour hot water over these things, but to really boil them to break those cell walls and make a decoction out of them. So what I'm pretty much doing all day, every day, especially in winter, is I have a, you know, pot and I have, a, you know, for example, chaga mushroom, I just break, break down the, the conch to get more surface area mm -hmm. and then just boil it for many cases for hours and just add more water and just, you know, make it a stronger extract. And that's that's what everybody can do who, who can find these things from their local forest. But of course, for many people, just these kind of extracts. Uh, I really like, for example, Four Sigma Foods is, is one of the companies that I was early advisor mm -hmm. for. And I've tried them. Yeah, I, I like the, yeah. their products a lot. So you mentioned Cordyceps. So here is, for example, a really high potency dual extracted you know, cordyceps in a really nice, you know, sachet. What do people I, feel? Like, let's say someone takes it for the first time. Does that person feel an immediate effect or is there, does, do you need to lead up to well, a more profound effect? Well, it of course depends. I've, I've uh, had pretty wide array of, of feedback from these things. Somebody who's, you know, um, overtrained themselves and they take a uh, higher amount of, of Rishi extract, they get sleepy because that's pretty much the the compounds telling yourself that you, you actually need to rest. So they start to mo modulate your um, HPA axis and, and these systems that are responsible for, you know, controlling your your stress response and stuff like that. And, and these mechanisms are in, in many cases pretty well known and mapped out. but. For example, cordyceps is, is 
of course one of the oldest things in Chinese medicine for your you know for your lungs and and um, you know increasing the oxygen intake and stuff like that so so many people use that as a pre-workout you know stack and and stuff like that and and they, they report that they get benefit from those but I think it's so individual because some people don't notice anything and, and some people notice immediate effects from, from these things. So I'm not saying that everybody will be, you know, shooting a spider web from their wrists in, in the first <laughs> beginning. <laughs> because that's, that's not going to happen. Do, could you recommend, like, if I asked you uh, for specific effects? Um, let's say, for example, to raise testosterone, would you be able to recommend certain supplements for that? Because, you know, I've done a project on testosterone and a lot of people ask me, what can I do in order to raise my testosterone naturally? Yes. So I think that the biggest things are, of course, to, to you know, map out if you have deficiencies around zinc or selenium or stuff like that that are known that if you have those right. you know things low and then you you know uh, get them in a sufficient amount that helps a lot but right. if you don't have those things then i i would see that the uh, the effect is much milder you can probably you know get the uh, a percent of two or two percent effect from certain supplements or things but in those those senses i think that it's just much better to focus on getting quality sleep and you know lift <laughs> lift heavy weights and stuff like that but um right of course there are a lot of things that you can do but i haven't never seen anybody being like this really you know helped me a lot but but just to focus on minerals high quality fats and more kind of macro perspective in in nutrition and i think people should also be careful because Uh, I actually asked Ben Greenfield, which I recorded with uh, just a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, about uh, something that I've heard, uh, Tonkat Ally, I think it's called. Yes. And he told me to be careful with that because there's not so much research. And I think everyone always question when you hear something that mm -hmm. ha has a supposedly you know strong effect on anything, being it a hormone or another mm -hmm. uh, you know, physical capability always question look at the research look at our blogs that guys like us write because we do yes. the work for you uh, but i think you agree with that right yeah definitely because there are a lot of things in in that nature whether it was i think the most wild out stuff is like pine pollen that contains you know testosterone and epitestosterone by itself and you can make tinctures out of that and maybe even get a small amount of of bioactive testosterone in your body but i don't you know no <laughs> but but <laughs> what what is kind of a good good idea is to of course support the systems that have um, mechanisms that are not so straightforward but you know um get a get your liver going well you know to metulate properly and and make a good hormonal support system from your from your organs and stuff like that so that's much more sophisticated thing and there's no like silver bullets for that but uh if i would you know make a protocol in that sense then it would be something in that nature you know get a good amount of of you know metal groups on your diet and and maybe some things that work on you know inhibiting aromat aromatization of, of certain hormones and stuff like that but but that's not something that you would do with a few capsules of dognat ali or something like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah no totally agree actually this is completely random but i've got that as, at the biohacking conference i don't know if you heard about that it's called mojo 8.5 by sunhorse energy never heard but sounds sounds really nice <laughs> it sounds really nice uh and uh You know, I've tried it. The bottle is almost empty. Mm -hmm. I, I like it. It has an interesting taste. But, you know, I would just say people question these things. So if you see something mm -hmm. like that, which is usually quite expensive, it contains uh, a lot of herbs that I've never heard about. Actually, reishi mushroom is in there as well. But it's a combination of herbs and uh, do your research. That's mm -hmm. what I say. That's a good point. So are there any supplements that you would recommend to the average person to 
be aware of and to consider taking? Well, definitely things like vitamin D and then these kind of uh, major switches on your body, those those need to be at the at the sufficient level. But because if you don't have those those things, it's like so so many genes on your body are turned off and and those are not like just supplements. They are hormones and they are major players for your overall overall health. So vitamin D comes to mind and then it goes, you know, let's say I think that most of the doctors that been analyzing people's bodies for decades and I've had a conversations with them, um, most of the people are low in, in, in different um, B vitamins. Right. So that's that's something I think that whether it was B12, the whole vitamin B complex that is super important for your nervous system, the production of neurotransmitters and stuff like that. So that would be something to consider whether it came from the really high, high vitamin B foods or just, you know, as a supplements. And I always prefer, you know, liquid forms, you know, just do a bit research what forms of these these uh, ingredients you want for your body for example in case of, of b12 it's mostly that people are you using you know cheaper ver- versions of of cyanocobalamin that's more stable but that's mm-hmm. not absorbed as well as you know methylcobalamin or stuff like that so there's of course a lot of things that can be said in in there but um then it boils down to minerals in many cases because I think that even though I've been you know eating a high high mineral rich diet for years I still am low in many cases when I do my blood analysis on just you know magnesium and right. u- u- usual Same stuff. Here. So someone goes into a forest what should they look out for what could they gather what could they eat? <laughs> <laughs> just pick something and, and try it out and put it in no, your mouth <laughs> no yeah definitely no i think it's it's really nice in in this age that you have you know google images and you don't have to car- carry around you know a book that has a few pictures but with many of these let's say tree mushrooms they are really easy to recognize and i i recommend that when you are picking mushrooms from the ground then you definitely need somebody as a mentor to really, you know, um, give give you the update or download around the process, how you can, you know, recognize them. But with tree mushrooms, I, I see that as a pretty pretty nice hobby because, for example, with chaga or with rishi, there is no poisonous, you know, species that you can mess them around. They're really easy to recognize. And then if you have, you know, Google images as a backup and you can just, you know, make sure that it's a, it's a right species. That's, that's really easy to chop, but that's for most Northern regions. There is so many easy, easily recognizable species in the forest. And of course, I'm not an expert with when it comes to, let's say a tropical environment or something like that. But, um, if you want to pick up, let's say, uh, more kind of a gourmet mushrooms from the ground, then I recommend getting some mentor who's who's a, uh, much, much more knowledgeable than you. And when you're if you're picking tree mushrooms, then it's very easy to start with, let's say, uh, chaga, reishi, um, let's say just a simple birch polypore, fomes fomentari or something like that. Those are very easy to find. All and right. they, are, they all, all, all can be made in the same ways. Just make a decoction out of them or then make a tincture by yourself. So just, you know, break them into small pieces and extract them into alcohol and something like that that you can put <laughs> under your tongue. And <laughs> what was that now? Written. That was actually um, uh, Chaga Rishi tincture. So all of the plants and mushrooms basically have, you know, fat soluble compounds and water soluble compounds and many of the for example in case of chaga the most potent antiviral compounds are on a surface terpenes and melanins and stuff like that that are not uh, water soluble but uh, fat soluble 
So what alcohol does, it you know, sucks these things out and makes them more bioavailable. So in those cases, I prefer definitely tinctures that are, of course, easy to carry around and very easy to make by yourself. So that's one good way to use these things. What kind of alcohol do you use, for example? Just simple, you know, good, good quality vodka that comes in glass bottles. Don't buy on cheap, you know, plastic bottle because it's a dissolver. So that's a good, good way to always recognize that don't, don't buy stuff that is in, in plastic, but just high quality vodka. That's pretty simple. I have a couple of friends here who are also into vertical farming and they're trying to grow their own stuff. Do you have a recommendation? Can you grow your own mushrooms? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and of course, now not many people again think about, you know, growing magic mushrooms. But I've <laughs> grown a lot of different mushrooms. Of course, let's say shiitake is very easy to grow. Um, you can grow actually chaga. They are pioneering a, a chaga cultivation now with a few universities here in Finland. And uh, Rishi is very easy to grow. Um, type in Paul Stamets. That he's like the guru around this subject. If you want to want to learn more about growing growing medicinal mushrooms, Paul Stamets is the guy, and uh, you can definitely grow these pretty easily. All right. Now I'm actually coming to a question that Demu proposed that I ask you. And okay. it's about the combination of chocolate and mushroom, because he says oh. that that is a, a specialty of yours. What, what yeah, is that, that all about? That's, that's pretty much what I'm drinking all day, every day during the winter. And uh, well, you know, um, when I started to you know, do, do these decoctions out of chaga, for example, that's something that I have on my stove pretty much all day and it stays there if I'm traveling for a week, doesn't go bad, it just stays there. I put vanilla, I put ginger, all the other herbs there and that's a super good base liquid for your, I call these elixirs. So you are, you know, putting into blender certain types of ingredients and then just using that type of a tea or decoction as a base liquid because in in many cases you know people understand that if you want to get benefits from green tea or or matcha or something like that it doesn't help that much if you drink like one cup of that, that you know <laughs> bag of tea but what you can do is you know just get bulk herbs and boil them in in your you know pot and then you have a liter of green tea. And if you have that as a base liquid for your smoothie, then you are getting enough of the ingredients to help your, whether it was metabolism or whatever. So what I do quite a bit is I use chaga tea, other mushrooms as a base liquid, whether it was actually for coffee. That was one, one of the early ideas when I I have I had a few cafeterias where we of course used you know high quality coffee to serve to our customers, but what I started to do uh, is to to use chaga tea as a base liquid for brewing coffee instead of just water, because chaga has been used as a coffee substitute here in Finland since the you know World Wars, so it's a very old idea. And the taste profile is, is kind of similar to coffee. It has vanillic acid and all these other nice flavor compounds. So if you mix chocolate with these types of mushrooms, whether it was a drink or, you know, these powder extract when you're making chocolate, they work really nicely synergistically. And uh, just kind of the baseline thing that what I'm doing all day during the winter, because it's a warm, nice, you know, drink that you can carry around and you can throw all the other super herbs in those those smoothies. Yeah, I, I love hot chocolate. I drink it all the time here as well. Uh, yes. And we have our own flow grade chocolate, which we developed here in Berlin with a manufacturer who owns, so they own their own trees in Belize and they control the whole process from, from tree to bar and they make our chocolate exclusively for us with with stevia instead of sugar so it's a sugar-free chocolate and uh, I sometimes I dissolve it also in hot water and I put some chaga in and some 
some MCT oil and some cordyceps. It's that a, sounds awesome. It's fantastic. <laughs> wow. Actually, because we were speak, speaking of green tea and I was introduced to that uh, a while ago, I asked Demo about it and he warned me a little bit about it because uh, it's working on the opioid receptors and it's called Kratom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are you familiar with, with that? What do you know about it? Yeah, I'm actually, you know, um, product development or a product specialist for, for one functional food company here in Finland who who is selling, you know, green tea extracts. And uh, we've been getting uh, uh, some of feedback from the customers that are getting um, not injuries, but, but not that beneficial effects on their liver. And there are differences with people with, uh, you know, different genetic uh, prepositions and stuff like that. So it's, it's not something that can be recommended for everybody. That's not kind of a super safe herb for a lot of people when it comes to these more stronger extract of easy e g c g <laughs> type of <laughs> type of things. So so there's some cautions to be made around green tea extracts. Okay, yeah, thank you for that insight. Switching gears. So one of your major products projects right now is the biohackers handbook yes and uh, i assume that you're probably working uh well mostly with the nutrition chapter right mm -hmm. uh, is there already a timeline for when when it will be published I I, yeah i think them said that the, the nutrition chapter is is actually now translated into english so so we finished with the nutrition chapter somewhere around the spring in, in Finnish, but now we are, you know, we've been publishing the sleep chapter that's available for free all, already in English at, I think, biohackingbook.com. And sleep uh, chapter I've read, it's fantastic. I love it. Yes. Uh, so now we are translating all the, all the chapters that we've written before. So we published in Finnish now um, sleep, mind, nutrition and now we're pretty much done with the exercise chapter and then we have only work chapter left and then all of those will be published also in in english but uh, i think they said like last week that the nutrition chapter is now translated into english so i, I think it's it's pretty much uh that we we can publish that pretty soon so um uh, i don't know Fantastic. that will be available through that to that uh, same website, biohackingbook.com. If you need a translation into German, then let me know for sure. <laughs> That's more, definitely something. More than helpful. Uh, could you already give us some goodies out of the nutrition chapter? So what uh, are, let's say, three hacks that are in there? Because in the, I really like that in the sleep chapter, there's a lot you know, about how to set up your bedroom mm -hmm. and how to... Uh, what supplements to use, but do you have like three things on top of your head that, that you could give the listeners? Yeah, I think in every chapter there is a um, pretty similar structure. We go through, you know, kind of overall things, then we dig into these systems that we are considering the most important for hacking. So, for example, with, in the case of, of sleep, it's the, you know, the whole tryptamine um, tryptamine um, neurotransmitter med meter pathway, you know, melatonin pathway, how you can, you know, increase the production of melatonin when it comes to, to sleep and whether it was through nutrition, whether it was through, you know, light manipulation or, or other types of things. And, and the same goes through with the, every chapter. So at this point of the year, I think one of the great things is to, to understand the importance of, of light and the importance of actually uh, air quality inside of your home, because most of the people are sitting much more inside uh, during the winter. And then it's much more important that you are optimizing the workspace or your bedroom. How is the air quality there? Are you getting enough ions in there? How are your lights adjusted? Uh, can you, you know, anchor light during the midday? So you're kind of uh, uh, calibrating your melatonin 
production cycle during the day because like third of your genome is calibrated um, these, to these circadian rhythms. So that's a super important part, especially in the winter where when we lack light um, and then we are pretty much sitting inside the whole day, at least most of the people. So I think that that's a great thing that if you can have like strong full spectrum light at midday and get that into your eyes for at least a few hours, that would be super good. Um, get sufficient amounts of vitamin D. These, these uh, periods are very, very um, important in that sense. So that's kind of the inner, inner light that you need. Mm -hmm. um, what else? Then when it comes to nutrition, I really like the idea of increasing a bit of um, herbs and spices that work uh, thermogenically. So they increase a bit of your inner, uh, inner fire, so to say. So whether it was, you know, cayenne peppers, ginger, I had maca in that smoothie. That's a really nice mm -hmm. super root for that. So things in those those terms, um, then I think it's this is just good time at least here in North when it's dark to do more meditation practice and just get get uh, that immersion going because when it's summer you are just want to be going so this is kind of the 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 season to dig deeper into yourself and and your goals and inspirations and stuff like that so that's kind of the mind side of that thing and. Uh, what else? I just, you know, at my office, I just had a nice rebounder there. It's a new new office, so hack the workspace. Mm -hmm. At least have a have an adjustable uh, table where you can either sit. I have a nice saddle chair, um, or or then um, you can of course stand there. You have some kind of um, air filter, HEPA filter in there especially in, in winter when air is not, you know, going through that much and all that dead skin is floating around that you can pretty much see when the light light comes from your, your window. So have some kind of uh, air, air filter in the rooms that you are spending most of the time. And uh, yeah, repounder or something like that is, is, I think, really nice for getting those micro breaks during your work day. So fantastic there's a, few, there's a few hacks fantastic advice no really really good advice uh and maybe because a lot of people here as well in berlin are struggling in the winter usually around you know january february when the, the winter has gone on for a while with the so-called seasonal affective disorder or winter and yes. depression what you just described uh do you know already i was reading a little bit about it and that apparently one of the causes is a dysfunctional melatonin, serotonin met metabolism. Mm -hmm. Do you know more about that? What is the actual cause of the so-called winter blues? I'm not sure if that's like so well known that what's the what's the root cause in there. But of course, I think that's that's highly related that um, most of the people who suffer from, you know, sleep disorders are also more on the side of, of kind of a depressive baseline state of their mind because, you know, serotonin is produced from tryptophan and 5-HTP and then metabolized into melatonin. That's kind of the end product of those tryptamines. But once again, there is B vitamins that are uh, working as cofactors in production of those those things and in the end it comes down that the you know over 90 percent of your serotonin is produced in your gut so many people are just they have so shitty quality <laughs> quality nutrition and uh, they are not focusing on your gut health so the gut brain axis is is just telling that you are not going to feel very well if you are not focusing on your, on your gut and uh, you know working with your your microbiome and all the all the nutrients that keep keep healthy biome going there so i think that's kind of the hot spot where most of the people are not looking that's crazy i didn't know that it was 90 percent, but yeah it's... i think it, it might be actually even 95 percent. but but most of 
most is, is produced there. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. it just shows you how that it is. The, it's not called the second brain for no reason, you know? No. And I think that, for example, the, the deeper that I've gone with the, the research, for example, around the mushrooms, because also most of your immune system is, is pretty much located on your gut. Uh, there was a big article published in, in Nature um, like six months ago that went through the research about uh, reishi mushroom how it's modulating your your gut bacteria and that's why it's so good for your immune system so i think in many cases the mechanisms boil down that they are helping your bacteria just to work more intelligently so whether it was the production of serotonin whether it was your immune system it's it's pretty much these kingdoms of of bacteria for example that are overlooked very much and that's just the, the the most important system to consider hacking if you're hacking your nutrition you're hacking your digestive tract and and everything is related in there very cool wow Jaco, this is so much uh, very good information i think uh, it makes sense to to stop digging deeper now and maybe save that up for for later but i want to ask you a couple more questions you know for the people that want to dig a little deeper uh so a little more rapid fire but what are you reading right now what books what do you I'm, recommend i am actually reading um, a book around msm which is a a supplements that supplement that is um you know sulfur basically and uh, I'm doing these uh, educational videos for one company, so I'm digging deeper into the science of MSM and DMSO, which is used quite a bit in, in medicine. So that's been one that I've been now reading for, for this week. The other book is, is uh, Jack Carrows on the Road. That's a classic that uh, I've yeah. never, never read. So that's, that's on my bookshelf right now. And other than that, I've just had a pile of, of medical literature, you know, science articles that I I read every day. So I, I try to at least read one one article a day. So that's so, one of my reading habits. A true biohacking nerd. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about any mobile apps? Do you? What are your favorite mobile apps that that you've added over the last, let's say, six months? Uh, well, I've started using more Excel. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else? Well, I just I've been using more Evernote. That's been something I've, I've you know tried to figure out all of those you know time management and and note apps that would work best for me. And I just used more Evernote, and and I've been doing a lot of you know. Excel sheets and, and tracking about different things. And I also use, use that from my phone. Um, other than that, I don't think there's too much that I do daily. I just, you know, listen a lot of podcasts. So I, I like Overcast. That's a nice app for, you know, listening podcasts. There's a few, few tools there that I really like. Um, mm -hmm. What else? Then there are, are, are a few, you know, related to traveling Glimpse, for example, is a nice way to tell to, if you're going to meeting that where are you coming and stuff like that. But there is nothing that I'm too excited about. I think uh, just podcast apps and, you know, Evernote, that's that's pretty much it. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, you know, I'm just thinking of it because she's also Finnish, Nelly, and she's uh, been on the Flowgrade show and her app I really like, which is called You App. Uh, okay. with Jamie Oliver. I don't know if you've tried it. It's very I playful. Yeah, I haven't tried it actually. It's it's I quite it's it's nicely done. It's really nicely done. Okay. It's, it's an awesome app. Uh, and especially, you know, for self affirmation, it really works. It just gives you it's a feel good app. It's it's fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. This is a lot of information. I think uh you know, at this point I just want to say thank you. Jaco, thank this you. was amazing and I'm going to you know, do it justice and write up a really nice uh, article on, on everything and, and put the links there and uh, also where people can find you. So I know you have yeah, a website. Yeah, pretty much just info or .com. 
you can find all the social media stuff from there, but pretty much just everything related to Jaakko Halmetoja. So Twitter slash Jaakko Halmetoja, Instagram slash Jaakko Halmetoja. So that's what's up. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much for listening to another episode of the Flow Great Show. If you like this one, then make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to this podcast, and if you're interested in more cool stuff about the art of biohacking, self-optimization, upgrading mental and physical performance, then check us out on flowgrade.com and sign up for the newsletter and you won't miss the next episode of the Flow Great Show. Until then, stay Flow Great.